so long for the ride. Oh, well, then I can go. Me too. <laughs> I can head over there right. and do work. Herman and I are just here to make y'all look good. <laughs> we call this special workshop meeting the Council to Order. And we have a copy of the proposed agenda for tonight, and it will involve uh, budget discussions and uh, entertain a motion to adopt. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? You see the uh, control? All right. Dr. Woodruff, the show is all yours. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, members of council, as we begin this evening, we would like to take just a moment to recognize the passing of a long-term city employee. On Thursday of this past week, Michael Urey, who was a 22-year veteran with the city sanitation department, passed away after a brief illness. Yesterday, we had the honor to attend his services, and we, delay, we relayed to the family the condolences on behalf of the mayor and council. Likewise, as is your tradition, the mayor and council purchased the blanket for the casket. His family is most appreciative of your thoughts, and again, we appreciate what Michael did as an employee with the city. This evening we're beginning our second uh, activity relative to the budget uh, in your computer or in your paper copy <laughs> if you will turn to page uh, 55. As you're doing that, uh, we had several budget notes from the last meeting. One had to do with the interest earnings uh, on the finance department and you can see that due to a series of activities we are budgeting that in very conservative fashion. But as you look at the other three or four notes, uh, two had to do with the transportation. We did find that we had uh, double accounted, so that extra $60,000 will be returned to the general fund budget, uh, fund balance. Uh, you also saw a good explanation that Mr. Prince gave you, which explains what a project year is. Uh, we think of projects sometimes as capital projects, such as building a facility. On the other hand, uh, when you deal with uh, federal grants, whether it's community development block grant money or Department of Transportation money, a project is actually a year's worth of expenditure, but you don't necessarily have to expend that money in any one year. So it would include operating costs as well as capital. Uh, beyond those, those were the five points that we recorded for uh, response back to you. Do you have any other clarifications you need on those five points? Okay. If you have the opportunity uh, now to pull up uh, page 55, and we'll do that. Um, of course, we had our first session last week, and we have sessions scheduled for the 21st, 28th, 5th, 12th, and 19th. If you're ready by the 5th, when we have the public hearing, it's possible you could actually have adoption. And of course, if we're not ready by the 19th, we have until June the 30th to actually approve the budget. Last week, you saw an overview, forecast, the organization of the budget, the department issues, and proposed authorized positions. And you will also recall that we went through a number of departments. In honor of the uh, time tonight, we would like to begin with community programs and cover the items that are shown here in blue, and also cover finance, general fund, non-departmental, public safety, recreation parks, and hopefully through development services. But uh, we also know that tonight we have the volunteer recognition dinner, so our goal is to do everything we can between now and 5.30, if that works for you. With that, let's uh, begin to talk about uh, tonight's budgets. We're beginning with community programs, and let me get my, my budgets out. The purpose of community programs is basically to engage the community and to make sure that the affairs of the city don't just look inward, but they also look outward. These are things such as the special events that we hold for recognition at the Beirut Memorial. They're the activities of the Civic Affairs Committee. Uh, this is an important component that takes a significant amount of interdepartmental relations so many of the expenditures needed to do something such as the Beirut Memorial or the 9-11 ceremony are actually covered in budgets of police or fire or in the recreation areas and you really don't see the total expense of, of your community activities. What you do see in this budget is generally a reduction in, uh, in the overall budget. Why is that? For a number of years, the uh, youth center across the street 
has been budgeted and funded in this area. Uh, last year, the mayor and council provided funds for us to do some substantial improvements in air conditioning and in flooring and just the general condition of that facility. With that, we made a decision that we would transfer the responsibility of the budgeting over to the recreation department so that they can lease that facility out, rent it out as they do the other facilities. So while it looks like we're saving a lot of money here, that money's actually been transferred over to Parks and Recreation. You can see again the overhead uh, allocation that is here. Staffing of this are two persons, that is uh, Glenn and Carmela. Those are your two staff persons. And when you look at the overall budget for community uh, programs, uh, you can see that it has gone down uh, a little bit. This is the area that uh, we would like to take a moment, and Mr. Bittner, if you would mind standing up, I have a presentation I'd like to give you. Mr. Bittner, I know that many citizens contacted you regarding the fact that we no longer had our calendar with various pictures in it, such as the Tansom 7. <laughs> so the staff has made a special calendar for you for 2016. <laughs> so congratulations. <laughs> now, don't look at the fact that it has 2014 dates in it. In a person, you know, playing golf, it really doesn't matter what day of the week it is or what day of the month it is. Well, if you really wanted to save money, you'd go back seven years and the dates would come out the same. <laughs> That's the reason why you're in the way of the But I appreciate the thought. Was there any uh, pickleball uh, stuff in there for, you for him? Used a calendar for seven years now. Well, it does bring up uh, you know, one of the points. Uh, Mr. Bittner has asked, uh, and we can certainly discuss it as one of the issues. We can discuss it now. The possibility of going back to this style calendar rather than the stream, streamlined calendar. Uh, what we will do is provide you uh, more information about how many copies that we run and what the actual expense would be. But uh, it certainly was not our intention to uh, get out in front of council. I'll accept the responsibility of the fact that I did get out in front of council and several of you have asked, well, why did you do this instead of that? It was a financial decision, and not all financial decisions are good, but it's something y'all can give further direction as to whether you want us to go back to a calendar of this level. Mr. Bittner, any comments, sir? Later. <laughs> Whichever calendar, we'll make sure it has all 365 days in it. And March, Gail has said from this point on, March is going to have 34 days because she can't get the budget done in 31 days. <laughs> So, thank you. Uh, the next thing, the next budget is tourism. As you know, this is uh, something that is funded by the occupancy tax. We would remind you that the tourism formula is established by state legislation. And the, uh, the $900,000 is our best estimate based upon current collections. And I would also yield to, of course, the chairman of the TDA is uh, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Bazara, and also to Gail for any comments that they may want. But this is uh, basically expended one third on capital projects and two thirds on public relations and marketing. Comments, so, sir. I just got one question I'd like to ask: is, is, is what what percentage of our uh, occupancy tax now is is obligated? It's two-thirds, one-third. No, I mean, in terms of obligated, we have on the, capitals, on the capital side, we have, um, I would say, probably a 85%. So you Gary, would you? We can look that up. Yeah, we can look it up and give you the exact number. But so you, might, got, you got some wiggle room now. We have a little wiggle room, but most of the funds are committed uh, to, to the various projects, whether, you know, in the past it's been the Freedom Fountain and the uh, Vietnam Memorial and uh, the um, uh, Sturgeon City uh, project. What we'll do, Mayor, is we'll but give we can you, give you an exact... Uh, we'll give breakdown. you a breakdown of all current obligations, how much they are per year and what year they expire. And then on the promotion side, uh, I would say that that's considerably less because we fund a lot of 
of local activities for marketing purposes and, and to help get heads on beds. Um, but we don't we don't do any direct uh, direct spending. We we only uh, we provide the marketing assistance and we we write the checks directly to the vendors. We don't and also for public disclosure, we do keep a certain amount in your budget. You'll notice it's actually twenty four thousand six hundred dollars for the administration of the tourist development. And I believe that is um, that's that pays for the insurance and audit. bond for the finance officer and those kind of things. But I think from a revenue standpoint, uh, we've been uh, fairly on schedule. Uh, we've seen a slight decrease, uh, but overall, uh, year to date, uh, we should be on schedule uh, to to collect those funds. We're fairly fairly. I'd like close. to see what the impact would be if the formula is reversed yes. too. Uh, where, how What's the status come? of the legislation? Um, well, know? it's um, it's been approved by the Senate, and now it's in in uh, the in the House. And in years past, that's where we uh, got the most resistance. But there's been some changes in the Senate in the uh, House structure, so we feel a bit more confident that uh, that we may get a little further. And uh, as you all know, we're doing a study on a multi-purpose complex uh, with the county. Uh, tourism and so we've got we've got some things working that that may help that uh, that cooperation with the house so. human resources is located on page um, 80 I'm sorry 64 and 65 in the human resource area of course it is allocated based upon personnel so you'll notice the overhead allocation between the various funds and the general fund. Uh, the overall expenditure this year is down from roughly 762,000 to 711,000. And the personnel have stayed the same. Let's spend a minute talking about uh, how that reduction has occurred. Uh, Ms. Lindsay and her staff have done a very good job of the three E's. When we went out this year for the, uh, for the insurance policies, one of the things we ask, these are insurance policies such as life insurance, uh, some of the accidental policies, some additional supplemental uh, medical things. When we went out, uh, we had 15 vendors respond. And using our professional administrators, those are not the city staff, but the hired administrators for the plan, they were able to negotiate some cost savings. One of those cost savings is that in the past, we had funded $10,000 a year for the employee assistance program. Through the new contracts we have signed for life insurance, that company, Guardian, Guardian, thank you, is providing the employee assistance program as part of those premiums. So that's just one way of cost savings. Uh, there were several other areas of cost savings that are in here, but generally the reduction in their budget was through efficiencies, which Ms. Lindsay and her staff uh, identified as part of your three E's. And again, the personnel. What are the allocations of stormwater? Is there a significant uh, personnel allocation for stormwater? Three people. Three people? Uh, some of it. Drainage. Well, I'm sorry. Uh, there, there are three people under Pat Donovan Potts. Uh, in Johnny's area, he has, uh, Johnny Stiltner's area, he has uh, personnel that are funded by stormwater also. So that would also include, and uh, I think that's like 15, Johnny? 20, sir. Pardon me? Total 20. 20. So there would be uh, 20 in Johnny's area and three in uh, Pat Donovan Potts area. Richard, does health insurance fall under this? Uh, under these savings? No, sir. No, not in this no. budget. Uh, and of course, if you remember the assumptions that we gave at the very beginning, uh, the health insurance, uh, those premiums were self-funded, and uh, those premiums we're recommending this year that the actuarial says we should have an 8% increase, and we're not recommending any increase be passed on in your budget or to the employee, that we take that out of the fund balance of the health insurance plan. Uh, the reason I ask is I'll, I'll, at our last league meeting, uh, we had a presentation regarding statewide health insurance programs, and there's a big concern about the potential future rising costs, and it's something to be aware of. 
I didn't know how we're affected and and. What are they attributing that to? Uh, um, turns over anything with the affordable health care, or or as it has to do with well, the there's in the obviously an implication with the affordable health care. I think we, what did it cost us, thirty or uh, sixty-three thousand dollars in one account, and I believe uh, well, roughly sixty-three thousand dollars. They just see rising costs throughout the state. Um, a lot of uh, of. Um, lack of programming within the municipalities for for better health within within their organization and they see rising costs um, in the projected future so I didn't know and you said that they recommended eight percent I'm not sure sort of what your plan is if well, it's remember so if it's eight this year and eight next year or eight this year maybe well the last two years uh, so that's fiscal year 15 and fiscal year 14. Uh, the last two years we have uh, been recommended to have a rate increase because the health insurance fund balance is over a million dollars and because that fund balance doesn't belong to the city per se it belongs to the city and the employees we have chosen to take any expenditures beyond our budget out of that health insurance fund balance this past year, we did not have to take any. In, in 14, we did not have to take any, even though we had budgeted. This current year, we're currently projecting about $91,000 will come out of that fund balance. But we had budgeted over 400000 So the employees, by stressing wellness and the other activities that we stress in our programs, because we are self-funded, uh, we are doing, and the employees to be given the credit, uh, we believe again this year that there's no need to pass on that rate increase. Now we will be the first to tell you that if we have uh, three or four or five bad incidences where we hit our maximum because we are have an umbrella policy, if we hit those maximums we could be looking at a different situation. But right now uh, things look uh, very favorable, knock on wood. And actually, Bob, it was an aging, that's what it was. It was across the state you have an aging work, uh, workforce throughout the municipalities. Employees that have been there for a long time, I guess, you know, they're all reaching that age out. And I guess that, that's where they're seeing a lot of rising costs. Well, that's why we've established one of our policies is city employees can no longer have birthdays. <laughs> because that way you won't age and you won't have these health problems. You know, the, the league's health pool uh, is really a valuable tool for smaller communities. But when you get into a community of our size where we have over 500 employees, we still believe that it is best to be self-funded. I would also say to you, though, uh, this year Ron and Kimberly and others, Gail, are going to be part of a study team to really <coughs> look at optional approaches to providing health care. And we will be bringing those back and discussing those with you because uh, nationwide, we are going to continue to have health as a major expenditure. How's that uh, voodoo witch doctor you've been seeing? Very good. Very good. Very good. <laughs> and just for the record, Clemson does not have a medical school. <laughs> and that's probably a good thing. Okay. I go to the NC State Hospital. <laughs> Better you than me. <laughs> Um, the city clerk Cal, Cal College. Mm -hmm. at the at the bottom line you will notice that there is an expenditure reduction of roughly forty thousand dollars the reason for that reduction is that this is one of the positions that we have eliminated in your budget uh, Carmen does an extremely good job as your city clerk we currently have a vacant position as the deputy city clerk but about, um, what, four months ago, five months ago, no, a young lady who was doing a very nice job as an administrative assistant in that department left us. We reassigned tasks, and now Carmen is only working half days. That's <laughs> seven to seven. <laughs> seven, okay. to seven. seven to seven. But that is an area that, that we have uh, reduced uh, staff in, and that was the reason for that reduction. Uh, the finance department. If you'll notice, the first line is rather a shock. 
you look at that and say last year we gave taxes and general fund revenue of 800000 to finance, and this year we're almost doubling it. Well, if you look down several lines to fees, you will see that this past year in FY15, $787,000. Well, 750000 of that was your privilege license. And the last time I checked, there are only about a dozen bills in the House and Senate that are saying that we should restore the privilege license. Or was that number zero? I, I think it was actually zero. zero. So you can see that uh, while we do have some limited fees that we will continue to collect, we will not collect privilege license. And what that means is that, you know, where we were getting uh, multiple sources, one of those sources has been eliminated for finance department. So obviously the general fund has picked up uh, the difference. And if you look at the expenditures, you will also notice that uh, they reflect a reduction of one person. I had a very fine young lady, Lee Humphrey, who's been a longtime city employee. She did our privilege license work. If we're not going to have privilege licenses, then her job disappeared. Gail and Human Resources put together a retraining program because we wanted to keep Lee in the workforce. When an, when an opening came open, she qualified for it. We retrained her, so she was able to keep her employment. But again, this department has now gone from 25 employees down to 24 and you can see uh, the reduction in the budget. Uh, not all of that reduction is one employee. There were some other cost savings, but generally you can see that their budget is down, and the primary reason is that reduction in the employee. Do we have a concern about, well, let me back up. It seems to me that one of the benefits of the pri business privilege license to the community was to be, be able to track hindering peddlers coming in here and make them pay a fee before they set up business. Now we don't have any control of that. <coughs> Mr. Bittner, there is a, one of the decision packages that we will talk about is even though privilege licenses have gone away, there is a section in the law that allows the city to require registration Registration is no different than, let's say, getting a driver's license. So it doesn't matter whether you're a good driver or a bad driver, whether you drive an F-150 or choose to drive something else, your driver's license is the same fee. So one thing you could do is to establish a registration fee. I don't know that, uh, that tonight's the night to discuss that, but we will be bringing that as a decision package. That could generate about forty to $50,000 a year on the other hand, uh, there are some philosophical discussions that if the state didn't feel that a privilege license would be, be appropriate, should the city in fact charge a registration fee? And that's something we can discuss. Richard, uh, I was going to bring it and I forgot, but the uh, city of New Bern is doing that. I received a letter. It's a $20 mandatory registration fee for everyone, all businesses, home and or other. And I think a lot of that, too, was done for administering their program, their uh, recall program, too. Like the police department, you know, they have the stickers where they have to keep a, they keep a database or addresses and, and stuff for the people that own the business or people that could be called back out in the event of an emergency or some situation. Now, I, I think that's actually the pretext that that is that's allowable right. under. That, that law is based uh, on exactly what you explained, the ability to have proper records for police and fire to contact people with. And again, that's something that we can bring you and have planned to bring you more information on. It is not built into your budget as a revenue source, though. But there are still some hopefuls that some, some ability or some form of revenue replacement may come forward. You're Italian, aren't you? I am. Yeah. Okay. See, you're 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 from a hopeful nation. <laughs> Optimist, <laughs> optimistic <laughs> nation. You make pizzas on the side. He's, re <laughs> He's related to Mandrake the magician. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I'll be quite honest with you, Mr. Lazara. Um, uh, from a budget standpoint, we do not believe that we will see any revenue from the privilege license or any legislation <laughs> that will, quote unquote, um, you know, make cities whole. 
Uh, that's why this budget assumes the total loss of $750,000. I think the legislature, instead of holding harmless, they tried to hold painless <laughs> by telling us they were going to come back and revisit this when they, when they changed that. But there, there's, I agree with you. I don't think there's ever been any intention to revisit this. But we will bring the discussion regarding a registration fee. Okay. Gail, any other thoughts on your budget? Yeah. Just want to hold the line. Okay. And doing a good job of it. <coughs> uh, metering division, again, you can see a reduction in this uh, budget. Uh, the reduction in personnel is from six to five. And uh, going back to the budget itself, in your computer, that's page 76 and 77. You can see fees for the purchase of meters. Uh, because the economy is slowing, we have reduced the projected revenue from those fees from 28000 to 23000 uh, Debt proceeds are down because last year we needed money relative to borrowing for uh, vehicles. We're not doing any in that area this year. Now, the award for preciseness, I want you to look at the bottom line of the fleet maintenance budget. Ed Richards, would you mind standing up a moment? <laughs> every, every department head here emulates and considers Ed as the pinnacle of budgeting. He came within $95 of matching last year's budget. And of course, you know what Gail said? Well, why didn't he go $95 <laughs> under? <laughs> Instead of over. But good job. Good job, Ed. Now, if you look at the, uh, at the budget, uh, it does reflect some of the uh, uh, debt proceeds we're in this year because of equipment that's not going to be purchased this coming year. We have uh, a series of fund balances. We commonly talk about the general fund balance. We just talked about the health insurance fund balance. Well, we also have a very small fleet maintenance fund balance. And what you will notice is that in 15, there is a positive number and in 16, a negative number. And since Gail doesn't let me do math, I'm going to let her explain to you what we're doing with those numbers under appropriated fund balance, because it's not general fund balance, it's fleet maintenance fund balance. Please. Under the amended budget, you'll see that there's $3,000 that we appropriated in their fund balance from last year. And in this year, we're anticipating about $41,000 more in revenue than the expenditures. So and that's so actually we'll, adding to the fund balance <coughs> in, the, in the 16 budget. And we'll get you a note on what the actual balance is in that fleet fund balance. But we're in the health, we try to build it up. In fleet, since it's shared with all of the departments, we don't try to keep a large fund balance in there at all. But we will get you what that fund balance is. And the purpose is? It's an internal service fund. I understand Yes, that. sir. It really, you can't balance, to not have a negative count. Well, we don't we don't want it to go negative, but we don't ha have a very large fund balance either. Um, should they have something come up, we do want to have a little bit of cushion, where we won't have to go back and ask the general fund or somebody to give them money. Yeah, because the difficulty is since their since their three million dollar budget is dispersed among you know twenty departments. If we ran over fifteen thousand dollars, how do you disperse that without a whole bunch of unnecessary or let's just say complicated actions before city council to amend this budget, that budget, and the other? So, you know that's that's what we do. And when you see the actual number, I think you'll be uh, satisfied that that's kind of a little safeguard from an accounting standpoint. But we will get you the purpose and what the fund balance do I is. I assume it was created by using overcharging the departments correct it was actually created uh, four city managers ago one two three. 
And of course, staff uh, stays consistent at, at 11. Here's one of the areas that is um, that doesn't belong to anybody, but it belongs to Gail and everybody. And let's let's look at the non-departmental general fund. This is kind of a catch-all <coughs> budget. When it comes to revenues, you'll notice that there are fees and special revenue projects. That $225,000 is 100 and 50 of it comes from the annual commitment from tourist development, tourism development towards Sturgeon City, that debt payment. 75,000 of it comes from the Sturgeon City Foundation. So when you wonder, you know, does that money, where is it accounted? It's accounted right here as a revenue source in non-departmental. When you look at the expenditure side, this is an area that has uh, a lot of uh, expenditures that you really don't think about in running the business every day. For example, it has $200,000, that's where your contingency fund is. This is where you budget roughly $270,000 for workers' comp. This is where you budget $80,000 this coming year for 800 megahertz. And in the years ahead, you'll see that number substantially grow. This is where you budget $30,000 for the Economic Development Council contribution, $50,000 for the nonprofit contributions that we give to places like the Women's Shelter. Uh, this is where we also budget $25,000 a year for the purchase of computers on the employee computer program, where we front the money and then they pay that back over a period of, what, three years? Two years. Two years. Okay. But this is basically a catch-all fund, but it's an extremely important fund because of all of the uh, various activities that occur under that. Now, Gail, is there anything here? Uh, let's talk about the capital reserve that's shown on this page. Uh, that is capital project. Let me explain the capital project first. We issued a bond issue that included $4 million for the Sturgeon City Institute building. We know from our latest opinion of probable cost that you do not have enough money left in that bond issue because we, out of the $4 million, we took the architectural fees. Now, the latest opinion of probable cost says that we are roughly $700,000 short. So if you're going to award that project in this year or in next year, you're going to have to have $700,000 more. This is, not, uh, this is not money that's available unless you add to it from your four cent initiative. <coughs> so this $721,000 would be added to the bond proceeds that are left, roughly $3,600,000 and change. So when we get to the point of receiving bids for that building, we're just showing you how we are preparing to meet that shortfall because we don't want to have a budget <coughs> next year that we suddenly say, well, you've got a bid in here for $4,300,000 or some such number, and you don't have the money to build the building. Now, we're not making a decision tonight of what you will or will not do relative to the building. We're just showing you that as your management team, we understand we have to put you in the position to do these things. So that's where that $700,000 uh, is shown in that budget. So is all the money that we have set aside, like for the Museum of the Marine that you have here, where, where is all those funds kept? In that capital reserve fund? They're an individual capital project set aside waiting for the expenditures to come and Where in. is that reflected in the budget, or is that just a... Well, that's down here at, in just the... Just as list. a line item? No, because it's... When you authorize the... Uh, remember, this is an annual budget. Let's say for discussion purposes, when you authorize the Museum of the Marine, right. we <clears> set up an annual payment of, a, let's just say, $100,000 a year. That $100,000 a year used to be in your budget because it was money coming to that pledge. 
once that pledge has been fulfilled, even though it may not have been dispersed to the Museum of the Marine, that money is in a separate account. Right. So because we have reached that million dollar pledge with real money, better known to NC State fans as cash, mm -hmm. we no longer have to budget it in your budget. Uh, in your audit, you will find a, a page that will actually show the status of that. Got it. Okay. So you don't have to reflect it here. You do not reflect it in your annual budget because it's not an expenditure of what you will. And what we're, what we're showing is actually the dollars that are actually in those individual accounts. Is that correct? There, no, What's in the parentheses is yes. what the balance of no, the projects. That, that was what was allocated in there and earned. Some of that was spent, though. Not yet. Not well, if that's there. In the case of the Vietnam Memorial, it well, was. Yeah, I was going to say the Vietnam's done. That's, yeah. and you had to show it so a million dollars. Yes, yeah, so those in are various, really budget figures. Various stages of spending, count oh, balance. Okay, not the balance. So well, that should be zero because that's expended out. I believe that's correct. Okay. But, that, but that is the total project cost oh. over the life of the project. But why would we still need to show it? Because it's a project. It, the project reflects everything we contributed and everything we spent out of it. It, so it will go away next year. Next year it'll mm -hmm. disappear because, because this was within this year's the fiscal year. Money. Okay, that so, makes yeah. sense. Okay. <laughs> Gail, any other explanations on the uh, non-departmental general fund? Any other questions? Because this is one of your complicated budget items. Uh, police department budget. When you, we have the chief with us. That's right, he's driving a six cylinder car, so it takes a little longer for him to get over here than the rest of the group. I want to make sure that he got over here. Okay. Uh, Mike, if you will join us, please. A couple of things to, to point out uh, when it comes to the revenues. The, the fees of $211,000. If you look on page 88 of your budget, you will actually see the fee breakdown. And you see that fees include everything from taxi permits to funeral escorts, record rotation members, uh, police court fees, uh, burglar alarm registration fees, false alarm fees, and so forth. So that's basically where that 200000 comes from. One of the misconceptions <clears throat> and I always like to make this explanation at budget time. One of the misconceptions is that the traffic division writes tickets and those tickets wind up with the city of Jacksonville. That absolutely is not the case. I believe, Mike, can you find a chair and, and pull up? Sure. If you, if you would. <coughs> Mayor, you, you know this from your previous days. The vast majority of the. <laughs> oh, hold your chair up. Man with a gun can sit anywhere he wants That's to. Right. <laughs> but, come on up. Uh, the vast majority of the fines that go for traffic tickets do not stay with the city. So where do they go? They uh, they go to the school system, which is uh, all fines and forfeitures in this state go to the school system. So we don't get, uh, we do get a, a fee, a processing fee, but it's a, it's a very small fee for every citation. So if a person is parked in a handicapped parking space, does that fee go to the school board too? No, we get a, we get a portion of the fee, but the fines and the forfeitures, any fines and forfeitures are given to the, uh, to the school system. So if the city, if, if the police department seizes a vehicle, if they seize, uh, if they seize any money through the state fund, which is the only way they can seize money at this particular time, it all goes to the school system. If you look under grants, let's talk about what those actually are. A lot of that money, if you will look on page 88 of your of your book, you will notice that under grants it says school resource officer funds and that's roughly two hundred and sixty four thousand dollars 
that is paid not by the taxpayer of the city, but that is money that the school system pays to the city. Now, what is the five million three sixty two? That is the total yeah. for since we've been getting that money from the school. So actually, it passed through money for school safety, and that's that's the amount of money we've been getting over a period of time uh, for that. So it's cumulative uh, five million dollars. It's, it's another project. Just I got you. The other one. So that's the total contribution. Since its inception, over right. time, they okay. still get all their money from the safe school. Grant. They do. It, it all it all is passed through money from the state. And you'll notice on all of the grants, there is that number that's in parentheses. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is several years ago, uh, a council member asked, well, how much money have we gotten? So you can look there and you can actually see, for example, in this case, school resource officer funding. Since its inception, mm -hmm. we've gotten over $5 million. What relevance does it have, though? Just information. Oh, okay. You know? The most important figure, though, is the one out there that says, how much are they going to give us next year? It's $264,000. I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing that you'll notice, um, you know, you can see the Bulletproof Vest grant. Uh, you can see the 9-11 funds, roughly $315,000 that we're projecting that we will get. And, Mike, where does the, where do the 9-11 funds come from? The 911 fund comes from a surcharge on your telephone. And, and I may add, part of the increase in our budget has to do with when we move to the new uh, 911 center, we're using more 911 funds than we have in the past because we added consoles, plus we were, we were charged uh, extra now from, from CenturyLink. So part of that money, part of that increase has to do with increases in the 911 funds. What about donations and contributions? I seems to me Church of Life has given by the police department some money. And I don't see anything showing up here. Well, let's explain why that happened. Uh, the church that you're referring to is the River of Life. And they still continue to make an annual contribution. They changed my understanding from talking to Pastor Chris is it is Pastor Chris, right? Okay, yes. Pastor Chris. Is that uh, they changed auditors and the auditor said that they could not make a donation to something that they could not directly tie to the mission of the church as a nonprofit. So now what they do is the annual donation, it goes to the recreation department for grants for low and uh, low income students, children, to participate in our programs. And when you uh, listen to uh, the recreation budget, you will see that as one of the funding sources. But they, I guess the auditor felt like that uh, protecting a police officer's life with a bulletproof vest didn't meet the federal standard, whereas <laughs> helping children get into recreation programs did. So that's why you don't see it there anymore. But we do, I know you do, and the administration uh, and the police department certainly appreciate the donation that they make every year. If you look over on uh, on the expenditure side, we have some expenditures this year that we're having to absorb, and let's talk about those. And let me read to you one of the budget notes on page 90. It's note number three. Due to the Attorney General of the United States' recent decision to change the way that drug asset forfeiture proceeds will be distributed or disseminated, $75,000 is budgeted to offset the projected shortfall in revenue as a result of that decision. This amount is associated with the specific anticipated shortfall in opera operational drug procurement funds and for the need for surveillance and equipment upgrades. You know, the, the, it's amazing the things that, that other governments can do that seem very minor that can have an impact on us. We're the ones arresting people and confiscating these funds, and yet it's the United States Attorney General who's now saying, no, you can't keep that money. Uh, do you want to comment on that, Chief? Well, what we used to do is because all fines and forfeitures go to uh, the school system is those funds used to flow through the federal government. Well, that, in, that practice has ended now, which basically has uh, 
has ended our asset forfeiture program through the state. Now, we still do, we still will get some funding. It'll be just a small amount, but, uh, you know, the state has a program where they tax drug dealers for, um, from, a, from a tax standpoint, if you possess a, a, a particular drug, that value of the drug is taxed by the state. But you don't see any of that, though, do you? We, we see a small amount of that. So we'll, we'll, probably, we'll probably get some, some funds back, but, but just a small amount. Uh, when, the, when the Attorney General signed that order, that, that virtually ended our asset forfeiture program. If we got four or $5,000 from a drug deal, then we would send it to the federal government. The federal government would seize it, take 25%, and send it back to us. Um, that practice is ended now. So you get nothing? Nothing. No. Well, if, if we are working a federal case that's initiated by the federal government and they seize the money, then we could possibly get some funds. But uh, I, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't anticipate us uh, the vast majority of the funds that we got before are actually cases that were initiated by our officers. The other thing is we all know that a presidential campaign, uh, actually I guess it officially began this past uh, weekend. How does that have an impact on your budget? <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't see all of the uh, announcements on both parties? <laughs> well, how does that impact us? We are the proud home of the Marines and Sailors. We've been contacted by the federal uh, Secret, Service. Secret Service, and they anticipate uh, somewhere four to five visits of candidates. Well, guess what? They're, that has an impact on your police department. Almost $10,000 a visit, and that money does not get reimbursed. So we are putting in the budget this year uh, you know, $50,000 in extra overtime for presidential candidate visits. Mayor, how do you like, how do you like that news? <coughs> I don't get that kind of treatment. <laughs> I don't think they should either. No, uh, <laughs> I would say we could use federal forfeiture money for that, but we can't. We can't. <laughs> we don't have that money anymore. But, you know, overall, you can see that, uh, that the budget uh, has uh, capital improvement project, the grants are shown there, and uh, the overall budget. The only thing I may add is in, in this budget also is body cams. Um, we, have, we have been studying the body cams. We carry taser cams, which is when, when a taser is is deployed, the camera comes on that's on the taser, and then of course we have in-car cameras. And we have some body cams, but we've been uh, actually looking at integrating those body cams with the in-car camera. So the video would, would be a constant video so that you can see exactly from start to finish. Um, so there is, there is some additional funding in this budget to start the process of putting body cams on our, our police officers. What would initiate the officer? The officer would have to control that, right? I mean, well, it, well, it would depend on the, on the model and the camera that you actually mm -hmm. purchase. One of the things that we're looking at is, is for traffic stops that may, may uh, when the officer gets on a traffic stop, if he leaves that vision of, ca of, of where he's at, right. then the camera, that the body camera would follow him if those two cameras are integrated together. So these traffic stops where you only have a short uh, distance where you see just in front of, in front of the car, a lot of, those, a lot of those incidents occur outside the view of those cameras. So if the cameras that we've been looking at would also be on the officer if he gets out of that view that camera that vision would whatever that body cam picked up would also be on that video could be could be looked at what is a have you looked into any cost on these things they, the the average cost? cost is about a thousand dollars a piece but um, one of the things that we've been that uh, that's normally in the budget is the life cycling of the in-car cameras 
these are second generation, I, I guess. Uh, first generation was the videotape. Now we're using uh, we're we're using hard drives. So this will be an, this will be another generation of cameras as we start to phase those in and out <coughs> with the body cam attached to them. I have to ask you, how do you feel about that? About the body cams? I, I think it's I think it's going to be a necessary tool, and I think part of the problem that we've seen in using those cameras is a lot of times, especially if the officer gets involved in some kind of scuffle or some kind of, they're usually out of the purview of those in-car cameras. So I think that just adds a little bit uh, more security. <coughs> I think if you talk to most of the officers, 97% of the time, the uh, the cameras, the in-car cameras, um, and th that's that's from the Department of Justice, exonerates the officer. So um, you know that's that's just an added level of protection if they get out of the purview of of where those uh, cameras. And the reason I ask is I'm just wondering how the officers feel about their, not because they're on camera, but just their ability to do their job. There's a, there's a number. What's the feeling of the officers? Well, of course, we, I think our officers are kind of used to it because they've been using those cameras. When they deploy their taser, camera already automatically comes on. So they've, they've experienced that. Some of the things that we really have to work through that are going to be very difficult is is the video inside homes and, and those kinds of things. So that's a process that's going to take us some time in order to resolve. There's some questions right now whether that, whether that information is public record or not. So, um, you know, the, instead of just saying we're going to buy video, we're, we're still exploring that. And until, uh, until we until we work out all those bugs, I think that's going to be a process over the next several years before we get officers uh, fully implemented in those cameras. I guess, and then my other concern would be, and how will all that affect our legal department? You know, are we going to be constantly? We might catch up with failure. Yeah. <laughs> Have four or five uh, attorneys on this. I want to mention to you, though, is that Mike has been part of a, a large group of uh, police chiefs around the state that are currently looking at our training relative to the use of deadly force. You know, it could, unfortunately, it has happened in communities. Very fortunately, it has not happened here. It could happen here today. We need to make sure that the protocols, that the training that we're giving is the latest thought and the best thought. It will not prevent something from happening because we all know that things happen, unfortunately. But I will tell you that for more than three months, Mike and his uh, leadership group in the police department have been studying and working with other departments, some of the largest departments in the state, to study this issue of use of deadly force. Do you want to make any comment on that? Well, I think I think one of the things that we we've been discussing actually we had a conference call today is actually re-engineering the way we do use of force. Currently, we do it in a stovepipe method. We do the legal part. We do we do uh, people who are mentally ill. We do so. There's a number of different ways we do that, and the most important way is trying to integrate that into one basic way of of teaching use of force. So I think what we're our goal is over the next uh, over the next year is to re-engineer the way that we teach use of force, and that will include from the BLET program up, um, and and doing it in an in-service way. And I, I think the mayor was involved in purchasing the uh, the uh, the prism system that we have, you know, back in the early 1990s. Still, do you still use that? We still use that, but we're we're getting we're going to upgrade that system so that the system actually actually mirrors what's going on in communities today to try to um, teach officers using a scenario based, also focusing more on de-escalation. How do we how do we um, communicate with people in order to de-escalate violent situations? So those will be things that our officers will be learning over the next year. And we'll be bringing you uh, many more, many workshops to keep you uh, informed. The most important thing we want you to realize is that while the nation is facing uh, these tragedies and situations, we have not been just sitting by hoping it never happens. We are taking proactive steps 
to determine what we can do to better prepare our personnel when they do encounter a dangerous situation or a volatile situation. Part of, part of the, the issue is, is the, that's assuming rational thought on, on behalf of the police officer. There's been a few tragedies where something had escalated and you know they had to respond to the situation, but there also appears to be some who, who don't, would not follow protocol anyway. Uh, that's true. Of course and so, you so the body that. cams will help right. perhaps provide some justice perhaps in those situations. Oh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very interesting time in, uh, in, in law enforcement right now based upon a lot of those events. Uh, you know, another thing we're going to do is, <coughs> is probably within the next year we're going to a new model of teaching. Uh, we've, we've done diversity training for a number of years, but we're going to a different model. It's called fair and impartial policing. And that, that mod, that uh, we're bringing in some trainers that will actually train our officers <laughs> in, in that particular model. It's, it's designed to teach officers a more fair and uh, balanced approach when they deal with certain circumstances. I think the other thing when you're talking about you know, the changing times in policing, you know, you see these things happen, you know, the, the, the ideal situation is to make sure that you as an agency learn from some of those things that are done, you know, and don't let those be re recreated in your community. I, you know. I think you're exactly right. I think that's, that's the reason that we've started to look at a number of the, the use of force model, how we approach that use of force model, you know, what, what kind of de-escalation techniques currently if an officer has multiple uses of force, even if those are justified, we send them to a de-escalation school. And uh, normally what happens is when they go to that de-escalation school, their uses of force drop dramatically. So how we integrate that into, into wholesale training is, a, is another important step that we'll be moving forward over the next couple of years. While Mike is here, we want to give you an update that's a little sidestep from the budget, but it does have financial uh, uh, implications. You'll recall about two months ago, we asked your permission to file for a Governor's Crime Commission grant relative to crisis intervention. We were notified on, uh, today is Tuesday, on Friday of Thursday of this past week that we had been awarded that grant. You are the only agency that can accept the grant. On your agenda on May the, I'm sorry, on April the 21st will be a request for you to either approve or deny that grant. We want to hit you with just a couple of highlights for you to be thinking about. One of the things that we, uh, that this grant is different from the COPS grant is there is no requirement to fund it after the grant period. If you remember COPS, you had them for so many years, then you were obligated. This is one position to be used for crisis intervention counseling. It will not be a sworn police officer. It is a two-year grant. It does require a local match, but all of the local match is in your equipment that you'll provide, your office space that you'll provide, the vehicle that you'll provide, which is a used fleet vehicle, and then the rest of your match is a proportionate share of supervisor, supervisory time. Now, I'll be the first to tell you that I believe that this will be successful. And your difficulty will be that at the end of two years, are you willing to add to your budget this as a full-time position or as an alternative, we will look at transferring a person from patrol or wherever in the police department to cover this position. The grant is for the first year, uh, basically a $72,000 grant, the second year is 70,000 and change, both of those are round numbers. And our match is roughly uh, 19,000 the first year and 16,000 the second, but it's not money, it is in-kind services. Uh, I'd like to have Mike uh, spend just a minute talking about what the purpose of that is. We will then pro be providing you with more information over the next week. And then on the 21st, we will be asking you, do you think this is something you want to do or not? So Mike. 
Well, I, I think uh, the, the other thing I'll add about the grant is it would be renewable through the Governor's Crime Commission in two years. Doesn't guarantee that we would have it, it's renewable. But this is a different position than we have, than we've ever had in the past. This is more of a, a counselor, social worker slash uh, crisis intervention worker. Um, with our homeless population, the domestic violence, the sexual assault victims, the child abuse victims that we have, one of the problems that, that we have is we just, police officers in general, just come in contact with them and then we're finished. Okay, if we make an arrest or, or we try to refer them to another agency, we don't do, we don't do much follow-up. Um, in the past several years, we've talked about crime and how we, how we reduce crime, and I like to say that we've gotten most of the low-lying fruit. Um, this position would allow us to actually, you know, especially when we talk about domestic violence and things like that, would allow us to, um, to actually prevent those crimes. Cause the normal person is assaulted around seven times before they actually get help. So on that initial domestic violence call, within 24 hours, this counselor would be required to work with the family and try to resolve those issues long before they become that issue where the person leaves or that uh, other things happen. You know, so our goal is to do that. Our goal is to have this person available to take care of some of the homeless, uh, the mental, the mentally challenged people that we have in our community. I mean, currently because of our, our, our mental health system is broke. So really the only alternative we have at this particular point is to take them to the emergency room, which Dr. Piper does not appreciate. Um, but when we, we have very little choice. This counseling position, who have a master's in social work, will give us the opportunity for them to work with those individuals and try to get them the help they need uh, and avoid us from having to to do either take them to the hospital or to arrest them based upon those cases and you know in the last eight or nine years we've seen a significant homeless population grow in Jacksonville and we're hoping that this position can help us resolve some of those issues and get them into transitional housing to get them back into mental health services to to do the kinds of things that police officers just generally don't have the time to do. I guess the thing to do is, is, is to establish whatever, you know, like you're talking about these, these goals that you have and then have some method to look at it and tell whether or not it was successful at the end of two years and whether it's something that should be continued. Uh, and that's, that was our goal is if, if, you know, with the understanding when we hired this person, look, you know, these are the things that we hope to accomplish. We hope to see reductions in domestic violence. Now, I'm not going to go into what, what those mean, but we hope to see domestic, we hope to see our, our homeless population shrink. We hope to see, you know, the ER referrals drop significantly. I mean, those are the goals that we hope that this person would help us achieve in a way that, uh, in a way that they may have actually a caseload of individuals that, uh, that, that police officers deal with on a regular basis. You know, I, I, I can tell you that there's at least three people that I have to deal with on a regular basis that could probably benefit from, from this position. Now, with this position, are we looking to hire from within, or would it be oh, something no. that we have to release out to the public? No, we, 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 won't, we don't have anybody in our, on our staff that would be qualified we would find some counseling professional right that that's what we would be looking for somebody that's more uh, focused and I can tell you I, when I was in Providence uh, doing a do an assessment they had that same kind of position and that position was very very successful in reducing their homeless population in addressing both child abuse and domestic violence victims by working with them on a, on a more regular <coughs> basis than simply the officer going out and saying look you don't call anymore or somebody's going to jail you know those kinds of techniques if we could uh, I appreciate letting us introduce that uh, Mike is going to be giving you uh, a write-up on this it will be on your agenda a week away but since we learned of the approval of the grant doesn't mean you have to accept it we wanted to brief you tonight and then the, the further discussion will be on the 21st. So, Sorry about that. not a problem. We still have 23 minutes, so that's good. 
Uh, let's talk about the fire and emergency services budget. Uh, we certainly are pleased to have uh, Spencer and Jerry doing a great job leading uh, the fire department. Fire and emergency services, uh, you will notice on uh, pages 92 and 93, you can see uh, the revenues. Uh, there are very few revenues that this department actually produces. You can see uh, fire inspection fees and protection fees, but that's you know generally thirty-five, forty thousand dollars. This is a department that is service oriented. It's a department that is there to provide uh, emergency relief, whether it's medical accidents or fire. The overall budget has come down. You will notice on the slide on the screen that debt service was 515000 That was basically for the purchase of the breathing apparatus, which you heard a very fine presentation <coughs> last year from uh, Battalion Chief Hardison, and uh, you authorized that. The $67,000 is debt proceeds that we'll borrow for one smaller piece of equipment. I'd love to be able to tell you that that's a brand new fire truck, but you can't buy a brand new fire truck for $67,000. One of your decision packages, which we will talk about in, in several weeks, will be the possibility of a piece of equipment, a purchase of a piece of equipment. The reason why I'm using that term is that we are no longer going to be talking to you about purchasing fire trucks. We're going to be talking to you about purchasing fire and emergency services equipment. The reason for that is, as you know, the building codes and safety, buildings are much safer, people are much safer. We have a lot of systems in place. But if you think your fire department, which I know you don't think, but if the average citizen thinks the fire department is a fire department today, they're wrong. It is an emergency services department. The last three months of 2014, we had over 500 emergency calls that were not fire calls. We only had 33 that were actually fire calls. So as we look at the future equipment needs of this area of city service, we're going to have to look at how we transition the equipment that we are providing. In the budget itself, Uh, the operating expenses have come down. The primary reason why they came down, though, had to do with the uh, purchase of the breathing apparatus. Generally, this department has held the line and the personnel have stayed uh, stable. Dr. Woodruff, in terms of the personnel staffing, with the promotion of Chief Lee, that didn't have any impact on this staffing, did it? No, these are budgeted positions. Okay. They're not They're not positioned by category. For example, this is not a chart that says that you have three battalion chiefs and eight captains or however many there are and 20 drivers or however many there are. These are the authorized positions. The reason why we ask for these positions this way is a lot of times due to people retiring we have to float people up and down the scale while we're filling those positions. They're always filled through a review team, just as uh, Amy Procopia. Procopia. Procopia, Procopia, thank you, was promoted through a review group, <coughs> and Captain Lee was promoted through a review group. <coughs> the people who are taking their place as captains, and then the further ripple further down the way, all of those are occurring. But uh, you are correct, uh, Captain Lee is one of the 91 full-time positions, or 88 full-time positions, and we have three part-time positions. Uh, questions, comments you want to make about the fire budget? Spencer, you and Jerry have comments or questions? Council, any questions? What, what, are, the, what are the part-time? I know one time we had a part-time mechanic, I think. Uh, would one of y'all come up and address the part-time person? They had a part-time person to fix the fix, breathing fix apparatus. Some of, some of the specialized equipment, yeah. Spencer, good to see you. It's good to see you too, sir. Thank you for joining Good to be seen. Uh, yes, sir, we've got uh, one of the part-time positions, a part-time fire equipment technician that helps to, to, to our fire equipment officer, and the other two positions are actual firefighters. 
And do they do they run <coughs> regular shifts, or do you call them in when you're short because of vacations? Why do you need yeah. part-time firefighters? Yeah, that, the, the two part-time firefighters just help fill gaps when we have uh, leave issues and things of that nature. Firefighters taking vacation leave, sick leave, and that sort of thing. And those people, what is their normal full-time job? Yeah, they they normally they normally are firefighters on a full-time job somewhere else at other fire fire stations within the county. Any other questions on Spencer? Anything else you want to add? Parks and Recreation. Still have a few minutes if we could move through those. Susan, you and Michael want to come up? On the revenue side, you can see that the uh, overall uh, budget has a $900,000 grant. What is that? If you look at the next page, which has to do with your expenses, that is the uh, money for the Rails to Trails final phase. That's 900000 It will join other money because that project total is what, Ron, like $1.4 million? So, uh, but that is, uh, that is actual grant money. I'm sorry, went the wrong way. It's actual grant money. It is not ad valorem tax money. Fees are basically the, uh, all the ball field, I'm sorry, all of the ball participation fees. It's also the um, uh, after school program. And I'd like for Susan to talk a moment about the after school program. You asked us to make that self-funding two years ago and we have done that, so please. Uh, we are self-funding that program uh, to date. We have over 326 kids in the after-school program, over 60 kids in the before-school program, and then we have about 30 kids in the track-out program because uh, Northwoods Elementary School runs a year-round program. So um, total, we have um, over 400 kids within those programs. And based on whether residency is, is either a non-city fee or um, a city resident fee or a non-city fee. And you will recall that last year we added Bell Fork Elementary School. So we now have, yep. for every elementary school in the city, we have a program there. And the school board is to be commended for, and the principals especially, to be commended for the way they worked with us on that. And the program at Bell Fork is really working out? It is working out. We've gotten great feedback. We have over 25 kids in that program, which, mm. is, which is a good number for us. So everybody's pleased over there for sure. Thank you. pick up my notes. Uh, if you look at the at page 97 of your detail sheet, uh, you will see that the salaries and benefits have changed. One of the positions that we have, um, have not filled in this budget is the department director's position. Uh, we ask uh, Susan and Michael to step up. They both have. We have flatlined the department. <coughs> And this department does not have a, a department director, per se. It now has two directors. Susan is over programs, and Michael is over the parks side. Uh, Ron does a very good job of giving them uh, daily supervision, not that they need that much. And uh, they certainly have an ear of the mayor's, of the manager's office, and I'm sure an ear of the <coughs> mayor's office, too. But uh, we have, just so you'll see that, we have stricken that. One of the things that this budget also reflects is that the youth center expenses have been moved from the uh, community affairs area into uh, this recreation budget. And even though the uh, total budget, uh, you know, you can see that it is up, but set aside that 900,000, uh, if you really look on the expenditure page, you will notice that uh, it is pretty flatlined, but that is that includes the building across the street. We are now renting it almost every Sunday for church worship purposes. So we're getting a good return on the investment that you, I don't like to use that term, 
but through your investment to improve it, you're now seeing rental income coming in. So, um, the other thing that I would uh, like to spend a minute talking to you about uh, are the, the temps. If you look on page uh, 98, you will see the budgeted positions, and I want to clarify that what went out in your book showed 43 positions. It's actually supposed to be 44 full-time positions. <coughs> Let's talk about the, the numbers. We had 40 positions last year. One of those included the department director. You're striking that from a position, so you're at 39. Michael has five people who have worked year-round that we hire through the temp agency. They work 40 hours a week. They get no benefits, but they are the backbone of his crew <coughs> year-round. What we're recommending in this budget is even though you'll remember that overall there are 10 reductions, we're recommending that we take those five temporaries that we are paying a temp agency 135% because remember the temp agency gets paid for, <coughs> you know, if we pay a person $10 an hour, temp agency charges us $13.50 an hour. Now, a lot of our seasonal jobs, that's, that's a good thing. But we feel, uh, if I can use the term truth in advertising, if these people are going to work for us 40 hours a week year-round, we need to move them into a benefited position. And so what we're asking here is for the number to go from 39 to 44. And we are picking up through other savings in his department we will not actually add to the cost of that department. We're doing other cost-saving things. Michael, can you give yeah, some uh, testimony here? Well, I think uh, obviously we, we do work temps uh, year-round, five temps, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to bring those on full-time. We have good workers, and they provide a valuable service to us. They are the people who pick up trash daily for us throughout all the city streets. They're the people who do the curbing areas throughout the streets, and they also work with our landscaping group uh, in some cases, as well as at the Jacksonville Commons. So, actually, the position that we're eliminating is or is going away is the um, custodian. We are not eliminating the director position; we just did not budget for it. So, so we're it's not in funding the, it. It's in the right. count, but it is not budgeted. No, okay. the, custodian's moving the custodian is moving over to um, facilities maintenance. Okay, so let me clarify. In the in the whatever the number was, 555 total positions. One of those is the department director, but that is not a funded position. That's correct. <clears throat> okay. And for custodial purposes, uh, this past year we transferred the custodian that was in the fire in the uh, police department where he now works for Alan Baker, and Alan is now responsible for that facility. Likewise, Recreation has had one custodian that has reported to Susan. It doesn't make sense to have custodial staff reporting to different people. If you need two people there because of an event, you need two people there. So all custodians and all building cleaning will now be under Alan Baker as the facilities manager. <coughs> Mayor, can we have nine more minutes? Nine more minutes. Okay. <laughs> Richard, before you let them go, I just want to comment that they do a great job. Uh, I think your decision was wise. Uh, Mike and Susan do an amazing and your team. They work excellent with the Sports Commission, and all the activities that we have. I mean, you guys, you really do a great job. And we get a lot of good compliments on our programs and our parks. And uh, you just need to know that. Uh, that was a good decision. Thank you. And they are doing a good job. Uh, real quickly, let's look at page uh, 99 then, planning administration. Reggie, you can come up. Now, this is another story. <laughs> I'm just kidding. 
19%. Uh, planning administration, you will notice that uh, it is about $200,000 less, and you will see the fees. Uh, when you look at the planning administration budget, the real bottom line is that we have reduced two personnel in this area. We had retirements in both of those areas. We chose to realign the program rather than hire replacements. And so the real difference between the budget in one year and the budget in the next uh, primarily had to do with the salary account. If you look on page 100, you will see that the salary account uh, is reflected there. There are also other minor adjustments you know, through the budget. Uh, there is no debt service this year because they're not buying any uh, vehicle that would be charged in this particular area. Uh, overall, you can see that the, the budget is um, flat. And then when you get to building inspections, you'll find a similar uh, thing. Inspection fees, they're staying pretty stable. I would remind you that at one point when the industry was really hot here, the fees were up in the 800 and 900,000 category. The fees uh, have reflected the cooling. About $600,000 is what we're comfortable projecting. I think we'll exceed that this year, but I don't want to assume that we'll exceed that again next year. And again, when it comes to building inspections, you will notice a reduction in personnel. And in all of these cases, this is where someone has retired so that we can realign based upon the amount of work that we're actually having. Uh, there may be uh, additional opportunities throughout the city, not just in this department, but where other people retire during the coming year, we will continue to look to see how we can realign. I would rather do reductions that way than to try to eliminate a job that someone is currently earning a living in. I think that's a much more proper uh, way to do that. Um, Reggie, any money in this budget for uh, to lighten things up? I'm looking around. I see the most austere, grim-faced people. <laughs> <laughs> you must have run these people through the ringer. No, it's you notice the smiling ones are the ones that are left. I haven't seen anybody <laughs> smile. Yeah. Maybe the ones that are still here are the budgets that you haven't talked about. We need, we need a court jester as well. That's it. We could get one from Clemson. <laughs> <laughs> get one from Clemson? <laughs> yeah, the one for the football team. Yeah, yeah. Well, the basketball clubs. <laughs> well, we won't go there. Okay. Okay. Uh, building inspections stay strong. I will tell you that our forecast is, is right on target with single family homes. We told you. Months ago, we do not see single-family homes being a strong uh, part of our economy for the next several years, nor do we see multiple family. Uh, much to my surprise, Ryan King met me this morning on some things, and he said, guess what? We're getting ready to issue a permit, or we're going to have permits filed for another hotel. <laughs> wow. wow. Okay. Really? Well, it's almost the same thing I said. Wow, really? So, uh, but uh, we do think single family, multifamily, and motels are going to stay very slow. We are still seeing a very strong retail market. We are going to continue to see that market as Piney Green Road Project is finished. You're going to see a number of improvements going out in that area. And uh, in the area right there next to the Commons, we are currently reviewing, what, 100,000 square feet of retail on the... Okay. Ryan says larger than that. So just in the area of Krispy Kreme. You put a Krispy Kreme in, Mayor, and it's attracting almost 200,000 square feet of other retail. It's the catalyst we needed. Uh, code enforcement. Uh, the number one thing that we would uh, mention in code enforcement is this. As the economy is turning down, we are having the vacancies. We are having foreclosures. And we need more money in nuisance abatement so that when grass is not cut and there is no one to cut it, that we have the ability to get it cut. 
because we <clears throat> we don't want the city to go backwards just because we certain that properties. Out? I'm sorry. Do we contract that service out? Yes, sir. We do, and then we put liens on the property so that once the property is sold, hopefully we will get our money back. We don't always get it back, but I think you would agree it's a good investment to help the city continue to look good. Richard, it's actually put it as a tax lien so that next year, you know, they are, it's just part of their tax bill. If they pay their taxes, they're going to pay that okay. uh, code enforcement fee also. Now, if they don't pay their taxes, then it would be when it's Regardless of who owns it, even if a bank ta yes. takes it back. Yes, sir. Okay. okay, well, that's good. <clears throat> and does those fees come back to us or do they go to the county? No, they come back to the city. Plus the administration. Okay. Is that one of your assistants handle this? <laughs> 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 uh, community development uh, this is of course our block grant program I would uh, draw your attention to the grant line if you go back and look at history uh, the grant line used to be uh, many hundreds of thousands of dollars more it continues to be cut this is our best guess what is really keeping this program alive though is the first line program revenue if you'll recall, some of our program uh, activities are grants. A lot of our program activities are low-interest loans. And the city, fortunately, has been in this long enough that we have, as you can see, roughly $170,000 <coughs> a year in money that continues to come back to us. Um, overall, same uh, staff level with community development. I would like to take just a moment uh, before we close, though, to talk a second about a program that we're going to be discussing with you, and that is the what we believe is an outgrowth of your advisory board meeting in December or January. When was it, Carmen? December. December. One of the things that, uh, that the advisors said they would like for the city to focus more on the older neighborhoods. And what we're going to be bringing to you in the next several weeks after we get the budget uh, settled is uh, the possibility of creating not a new department but a new mission and that mission is going to be called livable neighborhoods where we really try to work with some of the older neighborhoods now we're going to work with all neighborhoods but if you're in a neighborhood that's fortunate enough to have a homeowner's association that's good if you're in most of our older neighborhoods that don't have that then you have very little organization and you need help finding common solutions to problems, whether it's code enforcement or road paving or whatever. So we're going to be talking with you about a program that uh, Reggie and Glenn and Ron and I have been working on along with others to bring up something that we're going to call livable neighborhoods. And we look forward to, to those discussions. With that, the clock on the wall says it was time. Richard, before you close, um, I just want to mention that I was at a Housing Finance Commission meeting this morning in Raleigh, and uh, Lily's projects uh, were, were a, uh, a topic of discussion, an example for the great work that we've done here in Jacksonville. So I want to commend her and her team of, of, of redevelopment efforts here in, in our community. So it's, uh, it was recognized, and, and so that was very nice. Well, I should have mentioned that the, the two staff people who are really going to uh, do the work are going to be Lily and Carmelo. Uh, they have very good uh, ideas about how we can improve livability, and so we will be bringing more information, and we're excited about that opportunity. Thank you. We will meet again one week from today, and we appreciate your courtesies, and we'll get you follow-ups on those notes. Motion to adjourn. <laughs> and remember, 29 minutes from now at the Courthouse Cafe. Yes. For the All in favor. All right. All right.